Story time. There's a spot in Kentucky, in the Daniel Boone National Forest that always has and always will creep me out. My father has told me stories of him fishing around dusk with his cousin in this place. A branch of the local lake leads out this way through the hills. This one time they're out fishing and about head home when they start hearing noises coming from the surrounding forest. There are no houses and no other roads into this place. Out from the woods people come, and they don't say a word. My dad claims that they looked unwashed, clothes torn, just staring them down like something out of deliverance. I guess my dad or his cousin flashed a pistol and they both just backed off toward their truck and drove off. This other time I'm camping out there with a friend. This is sort of toward the end of the same road which would be maybe 5 to 6 miles long until it hits a dead end. As we're sitting around the fire around midnight, we begin to hear forest noises. No big deal right? Could be a deer or a raccoon or possum or something shuffling about. Then we begin to hear splashes further away in the water. It sounded like maybe a carp was splashing around and it sounded pretty far off at that. No big deal. The shuffling gets louder from all sides and the splashing increases in volume as well as frequency until it feels like something is right on top of us. We have no idea what so we drop everything and hop in my truck and drive off. After many discussions, we have never arrived at a conclusion and we have never gone back. The story I'm about to share was related to me by a good friend, a regular deer hunter. The encounter he described, I'll admit, still sends shivers down my spine every time I think about it. It was late autumn, the perfect time for deer hunting. He'd headed into the woods by himself early one morning, bound for his deer stand. The crunch of leaves underfoot and the crisp morning air filled him with a sense of thrill only a true hunter can understand. He was about a half mile from his destination when a spine-tingling sound froze him in his tracks. The distant howls of what seemed to be two wolves echoed through the trees, no more than a hundred yards out. The hair on the back of his neck stood on end and an icy shiver raced down his spine. Every instinct screamed at him to abandon his hunting trip. Forgetting his initial plans, he turned tail, making a mad dash back toward the main road where he had parked his car. His breath came in short, ragged gasps as he sprinted, the undergrowth crunching loudly under his frantic steps. After what felt like an eternity but was probably no more than two minutes, he realized he was being pursued. The howls were louder, closer now, an eerie serenade that quickened his pace. He burst onto the main road, his heart pounding in his chest like a war drum. Glancing over his shoulder, he saw two large shapes lurking just at the edge of the woods, their eyes reflecting the weak dawn light. They were wolves, massive and ominous, but their stance was almost human-like, upright and eerily similar to that of a man. He had heard stories of the dog man, a creature with the body of a man and the head of a wolf, but he had always dismissed them as pure myth. Now, he wasn't so sure. The creatures, whether they were wolves or something else, refused to venture onto the road, retreating into the shadows as he staggered to his car. They were indeed smart creatures, knowing their boundaries. He watched them fade back into the darkness, the realization of how terrifyingly close he had come to becoming their prey sinking in. He relayed this story to me, his eyes wide and still filled with the raw fear of that encounter. Even though I was not there myself, the vivid description, the terror in my friend's voice, made it feel all too real. Now, every time I hear a wolf's howl or find myself alone in the woods, I can't help but think of his chilling encounter. My mother and I live in Southern Oregon and have had multiple encounters with cryptids, the first being what we believe was Wolf Man. The second was some humanoid with wings, it walked across our roof and flew down in front of our neighbor's house, landed on two feet and just casually walked away. It sounded like it was wearing boots while it walked across our roof and hit the pavement, the wings sounded like Bateman's cape best description we could come up with. 
None of them felt menacing, until now. We were driving home from Vegas and finally hit Susanville for gas and a snack. It was around midnight Saturday night. A few miles northwest of Susanville on the 44 we started seeing a lot of wildlife so I was driving cautiously and had my eyes peeled for deer. I saw what I thought was a deer on the side of the road and slowed down to slow roll, about 30 miles per hour. It was huge and had long stilt-like legs, the front legs were spread really wide so I slowed down more trying to process what I was seeing. Its head was down eating, as we got closer it turned to look at us. The neck was thick and elongated, as it swung its head towards us we saw its face. It wasn't quite a deer face, I didn't see ears and the nose PR mouth was elongated as well, almost like an anteater. Its eyes reflected red in my headlights. We both basically screamed and jumped back from the side window we were looking through. I swerved and sped away. Looking into its eyes was absolutely unnerving. A not deer was the first thing that came to mind but I honestly have no idea what we saw. Has anyone else seen something similar or have any idea of what we might have seen? Thank you for taking the time to read this. My dad went hunting out in the Pennsylvania game lands and set up in a tree very deep in the woods. It was about noon but the area was a bit dark from the shade of the thick forest. He described it as a boggy, swampy part. He noticed a storm was about to roll in and figured it'd be too dark or rainy to hang around much longer. So as he's thinking about leaving, a 10-pointer just rolls up within a very close range. I don't know what is considered close but he shoots him, the deer drops dead. That was the point of him telling the story. Where it gets weird is as soon as he shot the deer, a man walked right past the deer. He didn't look at it. He didn't pay any attention to it. He wasn't wearing hunting apparel. The area isn't one for hiking since well, it's a game land and he was deep in the boggy woods. My friend's dad swears there is absolutely no way the man didn't see a deer drop dead in the direction he was walking in. The man was no more than five yards away from the deer as he walked by it. And just like that, the man seemed to disappear and quickly as he appeared. He still continues to hunt. I'm not sure I would have but I don't hunt. It was a warm summer evening, and I, Jocko, sat on my worn wooden porch, the wicker chair creaking slightly under my weight. My eyes scanned the surrounding wilderness as my hand gripped a cold beer. Retired life was a stark contrast to my days as a Navy SEAL, quiet, tranquil, predictable. But sometimes the past has a way of resurfacing when you least expect it. As I stared at the setting sun, my mind took me back to a mission I hadn't thought about in years. A covert operation, we were a team of five, the best the SEALs had to offer. Our assignment, to explore a sunken artifact, discovered at the bottom of the ocean, its origin unknown and possibly alien. I could still feel the chilling bite of the ocean as we plunged into the icy darkness. We swam towards the ominous shape of a craft lurking in the depths, the hull gleaming faintly in our torchlight. As we made our way inside, our flashlights cutting through the abyss, we realized we weren't alone. The creatures came out of nowhere. They moved through the water with an elegance that belied their gruesome appearance, their bodies human-like but horribly distorted. They watched us with vacant eyes, seeming to blend with the shadows. Our rifles were useless under the pressure of the ocean, and the creatures came upon us with a predatory hunger. And then, we found them, ten bodies, suspended in a twisted form of stasis, their lifeless eyes staring back at us. It was a sight that still haunted my dreams, a grim reminder of the fate that awaited us. I remember the sharp sting of betrayal when we finally found the artifact. It was a fake, a chunk of bronze cunningly disguised. Our hopes were shattered, and with them, our morale. But there was no time to grieve. We had to escape. Yet the craft was a labyrinth, its halls echoing with the cries of our unseen enemies. I fought, driven by pure survival instinct. But one by one, I watched my brothers fall. By some miracle, 
or perhaps some cruel twist of fate, I was the only one to escape, emerging from the depths to gasp the sweet, life-giving air. My triumph was short-lived. They came for me, men in suits, faces hidden behind dark sunglasses. Their words were cold and uncompromising. The operation was secret, they said. I was to never speak of it. The weight of their words sunk deeper than any ocean. I took a long sip of my beer, the bitter taste grounding me back to reality. I may have retired from the Navy SEALs, but the memories, they never truly retired from me. About seven years ago, I was a ranger in Colorado. I relished the job, the outdoors, the communion with nature, the respect for animals and plants that it demanded. My duties included patrolling the trails and park maintenance. A high degree of fitness was required, something I had back then. I'd recommend it to any nature enthusiast or social butterfly. However, a car accident, resulting in a severe right knee fracture, forced me to quit. My knee never fully recovered, and I couldn't stand for extended periods, rendering the job unfeasible. Now, here's a story from that time, two years prior to my accident. It was winter, the sun set early, and I found myself working late alone in the park. My task was to clean up the trash left by visitors and clear debris from the trails. That particular night, there was an unusual amount of trash left behind. Time escaped me as I meticulously worked to ensure trail safety. My life was simple at that time, single, childless, with only my dogs awaiting my return home. So, working late wasn't much of an issue. Amid the tranquil park silence, a sudden loud noise like a heavy object dropping jarred me. Thinking it a fallen branch, I ventured towards the source. Nothing lay on the ground. As I pondered this, Another similar sound echoed from a different direction. I saw the silhouette of a small person, almost childlike, behind a tree. This was unusual, nobody was supposed to be there that late. My initial curiosity turned into concern. I called out to them, but in response, they started running. I gave chase, not to chastise but to ensure they didn't lose themselves in the dangerous woods. However, they vanished from sight. I was taken aback at their speed. Despite being a seasoned runner, I failed to keep up. Reporting the incident to my supervisor, I was instructed to wait for assistance. But another thud sounded behind me, in the opposite direction of our chase. The small figure reappeared behind another tree. It was puzzling how they had circled around me without detection. Despite my calls, they fled again, leaving me disoriented and lost in the woods. In my desperate attempts to contact my supervisor for help, I found my cell service had disappeared. Fear began to take hold. After hours of futile wandering, I decided to rest and wait for dawn. Waking to the sight of a woman and her child walking a trail mere meters from me left me baffled. I had no memory of being anywhere near a trail. For months following this unsettling experience, nightmares haunted me. My colleagues searched for both me and the stranger that night, without success. They surmised that a prankster teenager and my exhaustion had caused the whole ordeal. I knew that wasn't the truth, but I couldn't explain what actually transpired that night. Maybe you can make sense of it. On June 22, 2013, I, Officer Jameson, spotted what I can only describe as a dogman in the middle of a dirt road. It was standing on its hind legs, staring directly at me. This case intrigued me, given the proximity to my home and the fact that this creature has reportedly been sighted by locals since 1995, including my own encounter. I've since engaged with several individuals who claim to have witnessed the creature. Two separate people relayed to me their encounters with the dogman in the Kempner area, located just off of US 75 between Crum and Sanger, in Texas and Cotton, Oklahoma. In my discussions with several residents of the area, including a former police officer, it became apparent that this creature has been spotted numerous times over the years. 
My first exposure to this phenomenon came from a local government official of a nearby town, who wished to remain anonymous. He shared with me that his family members living in Kempner had relayed their encounters with the dogman, including multiple instances of the creature chasing deer. Further investigation led me back to my own 1995 sighting of the peculiar creature. I also came across recent cell phone images captured by an Oklahoma construction worker. These images reveal an animal standing upright, like a human, near the I-35 between Durant and Gainesville, heading into Texas. My encounter and the compelling evidence I had gathered prompted me to reach out to other officials specializing in cryptozoology. We reached a consensus that this creature could indeed be a dogman. We also considered it may be the same creature reported to be preying on livestock in southern Oklahoma near Lawton, dating back decades. We even hypothesized that this creature might be responsible for the killing and partial consumption of two calves in northern Fannin County back in 2011, and a horse in Cole County near Bromide in 2013. This was following a sighting by a school bus driver on Highway 69 east of Tishomingo, who also reported finding tracks in the vicinity. I've gathered more recent encounter stories from locals, including a family who shared their potential Sasquatch encounters near their home. Armed with this information, my partner and I are gearing up to investigate the area further and search for possible denning sites. Wish me luck. I'm a hunter of wildlife photographs. Was hiking in some thick rainforest when I heard some rustling some distance away. Not loud rustling, just like something small was moving in the branches. This sound was coming from a spot that was between me and the road. And the approach is only a three to four foot wide path, and thick cover on either side. I thought it was probably monkeys, but felt it would be better if I left. So I started retracing my steps. Turned the last bend in the path, and now it was the home stretch. Maybe 30 more steps to the safety of the road. But there, looming right before me, within touching distance, was a bull elephant looking straight at me. Lone bull elephants have a bad reputation in India. I thought I was a goner. Life flashed before my eyes etc. He was probably puzzled too, and showed his displeasure. He stomped his foot, swayed his head from side to side, groaned, and crashed away through the trees on his left. I don't know why I was spared that day. Next day, in a completely different part of the forest, I was sitting under a tree, catching my breath. The forest here wasn't so thick, so I could see around me. And whoosh! Another bull elephant, but this one somehow. Can't explain, somehow didn't give me bad vibes. He appeared from 10 o'clock direction, approached to about 20 to 30 feet away, and then lost interest in me, and proceeded to take his lunch. We spent about 10 minutes together, my heart was busting, but somehow my brain was calm and I knew nothing bad was going to happen. Nothing did. He finished eating and left. I never went into the forest alone after that. This happened when I was 16, almost 10 years ago. Me and my friend were driving around on one of our nighttime adventures. We loved just driving around the city at night and just talking. We were on a pretty busy road. We noticed that off the side of this road, was a sudden dirt road that led off into the woods. It interested us, and this was what we considered an adventure, so what the hell, we turned onto it. This was a zone of the creepiest roads I have ever seen. Pitch black, no lights, no cell phone reception. Surrounded by thick woods, trees filled with cobwebs and there were clothes thrown around everywhere. You wouldn't think that you were in the middle of a city. It was weird from the start. As we're driving down the road there's this small cliff with large, strange black sculptures on top of it. One was a giant cube, balancing on one corner, that looked like it had faces carved into it. Another was more two-dimensional, about 12 or so feet tall with no features but kind of looked like a twisted human with missing limbs. This small cliff had a gravel road next to it. 
We drove up it and there's a large metal building with multiple rusted, metal doors. Those kind you pull up to open. I immediately looked at my friend and said, this is a weird as shit building. I wonder why it's here, she said I don't know, but we need to leave now. This feels bad. And there's cameras everywhere. She pointed them out, and sure enough, there were cameras literally embedded into the trees. You could see the lenses sticking out of the trunks. We pulled up just a little bit to turn around. We parked right there on the side of the road, once we got off the gravel one. We were debating on whether it was safe to get out and take some pictures. Just as we figured it was best to come back in the morning, suddenly, about five dudes appeared out of nowhere. They had the car surrounded and were screaming and beating on the car and windows. I'm not sure what they were yelling about. I heard one of them mention something about a basement. I thought he said, you drove over our basement. As we're looking around and at each other like, what the F is going on and what do we do? The dude in front of us picks up a massive rock, and looks like he's getting ready to chuck it through the windshield. She throws the car into reverse and floors it. This road is narrow, so she practically drives and reverse the whole way down. And we hit the main road and begin driving down it. I'll never forget as I turned around and watched a green pickup truck, with blue headlights peel out onto the road off that street. I turned to her and yelled, dude, they're following us. We drove through all sorts of places, gas station parking lots, back roads, this truck followed us through every single one. After about 20 minutes her instinct was to go home. I knew better. I told her if someone is chasing you in a car, never go home. You don't want them knowing where you live. I told her to drive until she lost them or go to the police station. She didn't want me to call the police, or to really even have to deal with the police yet. So we kept driving. Driving fast and taking as many turns as possible. Eventually we entered the highway and just kept driving on it. We finally lost them in between all the cars and got off on an exit. They kept driving straight. They chased us for almost two hours. It was insane. We would talk about it every now and then. Wondering what that place was, or what they wanted. We'd also bring up the basement thing and wonder if that's what they said, and if so, who's stupid enough to build a basement underneath the driveway? Or what kind of psychopath has a secret basement in the middle of the woods? Sometimes we'd contemplate going back, but quickly decide it was a stupid idea. Never been back since. But 10 years later I'm still curious about the place. For years now I have lived in a duplex located in a rural country town surrounded by thick, lush, forests, it seems rather idyllic from an outside point of view however, having lived here for so long, I cannot help but feel as though there is something dark creeping, stalking, and taunting our land. For example, I was in the woods one time with a friend of mine, exploring our vast property the two of us wandered to the property line, a wiry cow fence abutting a large field, when suddenly a small rock came whizzing by my head, barely missing me by an inch and struck the aforementioned wire fence with such force that it caused a terrible, ear, piercing, bang. It had come from directly behind me, which was all my property, so unless someone was trespassing, it couldn't have been anyone aside from family or my friend, but when I looked towards her, she stood still next to me, mouth ajar, just as confused as myself. Obviously I asked if she had done it, though I had my doubts that she had because of her position and she denied, saying she had witnessed the rock come from nowhere as well. We looked, and there was nobody, not to mention, no footsteps crunching through the underbrush, which we certainly would have been able to hear if someone tried to make a swift escape. Spooky right? Well, something even more terrifying happened last night and I require advice. My dog, Bandit, a young German Shepherd Blue Healer mix, has a tendency to get rather skittish at night, especially with the windows and doors being open as of late to let in the cool evening air. Of course, living in the middle of nowhere surrounded by forest, we all assume that it's an animal of some kind. However, 
This could simply be me being paranoid and not knowing what I'm talking about. Whenever we look to see what he is sensing, there are absolutely nothing. No turkeys, no bears, no coyotes, nothing. We have never heard anything walking around in the woods, which you can hear everything out here, including the cows breaking twigs in the field next to us, and have even gone outside to check, but to no avail. So, the other night, my parents were in bed and my sister and I had recently come back in from a bonfire. My sister explained to me that she had a bad feeling out there due to the distant, and sudden, howling dogs from the property behind us, hence why she ushered us back inside. But I myself hadn't gotten the vibe so I wasn't terribly spooked. Bandit began pacing around the house soon after we went inside, going up to a few windows and doors that overlooked our backyard so he could growl at something. Naturally we both were curious, especially with my sister's bad feeling, so we flipped on the backlight and stepped out onto the back porch, scanning our field. From what we could see, there was nothing, but Bandit was staring towards where we were looking, his eyes and head following something across our yard, like, if he was smelling a distant animal, there's no reason why he would be tracking something, right? He began pacing, still growling menacingly, before I noticed that our fire pit was still alive with some embers, giving me a new anxiety to worry about, causing a forest fire. Despite the eeriness, my sister agreed to join me outside to douse it, and naturally Bandit came along. We opened the back door and stepped out onto the second porch area, but Bandit froze at the top of the steps, staring out into the darkness. This behavior is super unusual for him since he absolutely loves going outside no matter the occasion, but for whatever reason he was scared into stillness. I myself was freaked out and said screw the fire, let's go, but my sister had other plans. She lightly pushed his butt forward, gently coaxing him to continue on, and eventually he did, but not without making sure the both of us were right behind him. We were both shouting dumb things like this is our land, be gone, and what not to keep ourselves cool and collected, which I think instigated whatever it was. Before we could take more than a few steps, Bandit began tweaking, suddenly jumping into the air and spinning around towards the darkness beneath our porch before scurrying away to hide beneath our glass table. Truly I was expecting a bear or coyote to come charging, but even as I gathered all of my courage to look, there was absolutely nothing. My sister went ahead without me because I was frozen in fear, but even as I stood, I scoured our land with a sense of determination, and there was still nothing but us in the forest. In writing, honestly, it doesn't sound terrifying, but just imagine being outside, in the dark, then suddenly your otherwise brave and loyal dog leaps into the air and runs to hide because of something that you cannot see. Of course, once the fire was out, all three of us bolted inside, and as we did so, there were no pursuing footsteps, no howling, no growls, nothing. It truly was as if whatever it was tried to get to us through our beloved dog and that was its only intention. Even as we entered our home, Bandit was freaked out, continuously growling, barking, and pacing our first floor. At one point even, as we were sitting on the couch later in the night, he began to growl at something outside of our open window as if whatever it was circled the house. Now, feel free to call me a paranoid idiot if this is normal dog behavior, but I truly don't feel like it is, especially since I have dozens of other, unexplained, occurrences at this house. Animals don't just react like that for no reason. But perhaps a sound unheard by our human ears caused him to jump and hide? I don't know. Ever since I can remember, my cabin nestled in the heart of western Pennsylvania has been a vortex of odd occurrences. Though scattered neighbors punctuate the landscape, for the most part, the place is secluded, swathed by vast expanses of deep woods. Over the years, peculiar happenings have become the norm, adding an intriguing, if slightly unnerving, backdrop to my cabin life. There's the neighbor who is bizarrely convinced that a Canadian invasion is imminent. He's resorted to stashing away secret caches of weapons and food throughout the forest, preparing for a standoff that, 
to everyone else's knowledge, will never come. Then there's the unhinged man who constructed a watchtower over his own house, using it as a vantage point for his disturbing deeds. He killed his wife in cold blood, attempted to erase his ghastly act by setting her body aflame. The morbid spectacle of it all left an indelible stain on the otherwise tranquil woods. Bigfoot sightings are part of the lore around here too. It may seem unbelievable, but once you're here, in these isolated, sometimes eerie woods, it somehow doesn't seem so far-fetched. I remember one twilight evening, sitting on the porch nursing a warm cup of coffee. A rustling from the dense thicket made me sit up. Peering into the near darkness, I discerned a massive silhouette, bipedal, shaggy, and decidedly non-human. It moved with a lumbering grace that was strangely hypnotic. Our eyes locked for a breathless moment before it melted back into the forest. That sighting forever blurred the line between myth and reality for me. We even have a local witch who's rumored to reside in the vicinity. She's rarely seen, but every now and then, someone will claim to have caught sight of her on a road aptly named Hexy Road. Whether she's real or a figment of collective imagination, she adds another layer to the tapestry of our peculiar locale. At night, mysterious crying often pierces the otherwise tranquil woodland soundscape. I tend to chalk it up to mountain lions, though I've never actually laid eyes on one here. Finally, the cabin's sinister history is rounded off with another murder over a love triangle gone terribly wrong. It's the kind of incident that would make headlines in a big city, but here, it just adds to the peculiar charm of the place. Despite the unnerving chain of events, there's something about the cabin that holds me captive. The allure of the isolation, the beauty of the wilderness, and even the strange happenings all combine into a curious charm. However, I must admit, the eerie ambience has kept me from hunting in these woods for the past five years. Who knows what one might encounter in the eerie silence of a western Pennsylvania forest. This one starts in a local park, around a year ago. For context, this park, although in a nice suburban area, is supposedly notorious for being rough. However, in my countless hours walking there, this is the only vaguely scary experience I have had. I have never felt anything but comfortable otherwise. I was standing by an entrance to the park, maybe 20 feet inside of it, at 2 a.m. in the morning. It was pitch black, I couldn't see a few feet in the front of me. The only light is the faint twinkle of streetlights beyond the far side of the park. As I'm standing there, earphones in with music as always, I could have sworn I saw some movement in the distance. I squint my eyes and focus on a spot on the far side, trying to make out what I noticed, for maybe 10 seconds. At this point, I realize, I'm not looking into the distance, I'm looking directly at someone a mere 10 or so feet in front of me. I shit you not, that feeling of realization is the single most powerful thing I have ever felt in my life. Felt like I was in a horror movie. Heart racing. I turn around and book it to the entrance behind me, and start walking down the street towards my home. I'm fairly shaken up but you know, there's nothing to indicate the guy had any sinister intentions, or even knew I was there. Could have been doing same thing as me. I'm now under the street lights walking past some well-off houses, which felt like safety to me. However, I then turned around and saw a hooded man, a stereotypical road man as we would call them emerge from the same entrance as me, and turn my direction. He was around the same distance I would have expected had me started leaving the same time as me. Around 10 to 15 feet behind me. Again, nothing sinister, probably, I thought. But just to be careful, I picked up the pace a bit. This street is around 200 feet before it merges with a main road. After around halfway, I turned around, and see this guy is directly behind me, 10 feet, as he was earlier. I think to myself. Well that's weird. I'm walking pretty fast and this guy has kept up. So now I start to walk as fast as I possibly can without breaking out into a run. I specifically remember going as fast as a walk would allow me to. 
I maintain this for another 100 odd feet until I get to the main road. Then I turn around, and this guy is literally 5 feet behind me. He is closer than he was before I sped up rapidly. Borderline pant shitting moment. I full on ran all the way home, barefoot in sliders by the way, without looking behind me until I got to my front door and that was that. Never saw him again. Could be a coincidence. Sure. Maybe I happened upon a 2am power walker. But also maybe I almost got robbed. I dunno. If I had, it would be in a different subreddit, lol. Thanks for reading if you did. I have more stories too but I've been writing these for an hour or two and my eyes hurt. For the amount of time I have spent out in the dark. Most of which is in the woods. I have surprisingly few stories. Got a few potentially paranormal ones too but they aren't allowed here. Consider myself kinda lucky to be honest, think I was tempting fate for quite some time. I was up in a tree stand overlooking a small clearing in the woods a couple years ago hunting whitetail. I didn't see anything all day and the sun was starting to set. At about that time two coyotes came from under my stand and were in the clearing playing and wrestling with each other. This didn't scare me at all and I was enjoying getting to watch them from my stand while the sun set. They both stopped though and looked in the same direction and then trotted off. I didn't really think anything of it at first, figured they maybe caught my scent or something, and started tying my bow to the strap I used to lower it when what I swore was a huge mountain lion came out and slowly made its way across the clearing. This did petrify me, especially considering I was about a mile or so hike through the woods to our house. I waited for a bit hoping that it kept moving away from me, lowered my bow, and climbed down from the stand. As quickly and quietly as I could I ran back to the house through what was now very dark woods. Bobcats are native to where I hunt but mountain lions aren't, my family who was also on the property hunting swore it was just a bobcat for this reason, but this thing was huge and I know what I saw. A report came out a couple weeks later of a confirmed lion spotting with a game camera in my area and I didn't go back out that year. Coyotes and bears don't really bother me, they could obviously harm me but almost never actually do, but knowing a mountain lion could be coming from behind me scared the shit out of me. I go shooting every year with two friends of mine in a very secluded area near a local national forest. It's far enough in that it requires an all-wheel drive vehicle in order to get to the cabin. We don't sleep in the cabin though, we sleep outside in tents since it's a bit nicer outside, and because my friend got bitten by a brown recluse inside of the cabin last year while trying to sleep. There are no other houses or people around for miles. We went to the cabin last year, and spent our last full day in a large clearing we had found about 10 minutes from our site, shooting all different types of guns. We headed back towards the cabin just as dusk was setting in. As we're pulling in next to the cabin where we always park, my buddy abruptly stops the truck and stares to the line of trees just a foot from the driveway. Him, you have got to be kidding me. Me, what? Him, in the past two days, have either of you noticed that hanging there? I looked over to the line of trees, and the old skull of small slash medium sized animal had been placed hanging off of the nub of a branch pointing directly towards our campsite. None of us had seen it before, and it was right where the truck had been parked before we left earlier in the day. It would have been extremely difficult to miss as my door would have nearly hit it as I got into the truck. We talked for a few minutes and decided that it probably hadn't been there before we left, but that there was nothing we could really do about it unless we just packed up and went home. We ended up staying the night in our tents but I slept with one eye open and multiple loaded guns next to me thinking about how our campsite had been marked. There's something unnerving about finding unexplained photos on your phone, even more so when they appear to have been taken in the dead of night while you're sleeping. It started with the update to iCloud. I noticed a picture I didn't remember taking. The timestamp was 1.58 am. A time when I was sound asleep. 
The photo was mundane, unremarkable, and slightly blurred. It captured the garbage can near my bed, a half-empty bottle of liquor, and the edge of the fan whirring softly in the corner. Just an ordinary, cluttered snapshot. I might have shrugged it off as a glitch or an accidental click if it wasn't for the second photograph that popped up moments later. This one was marked 1.59 am. What struck me as odd was that there was no visual data. The screen was pitch black, void of any identifiable elements. It wasn't a photo but an audio recording. The recording was flagged as being 5 seconds long, but it seemed to extend inexplicably to around 10 to 15 seconds when I played it. The sound was eerie. It was like the rustling of dried leaves, suggestive of someone or something walking in the woods, followed by intermittent bangs and a strange distortion. The kind of distortion that made your skin prickle and your mind conjure up images of shadowy figures lurking in the woods. I've never been one to scare easily, but the whole thing was unnerving, to say the least. A creeping sense of unease had started to settle in, and I couldn't help but feel like I was being watched. The sensation was heightened when a cabinet in my house swung open on its own yesterday, creaking loudly in the silence of my kitchen. The normally comforting familiarity of my home seemed to have been replaced by a sense of intrusion. I've been trying to rationalize it all, coming up with logical explanations. Perhaps I sleepwalked and somehow managed to operate my phone. But the audio recording didn't fit with this theory. I live in the city, there are no woods around for miles. The inexplicable extension of the clip's duration added another layer of mystery to it all. I'm not scared, not exactly. But there's a sense of disturbance, a feeling of an unseen presence. And as much as I want to ignore it, to brush it off as my imagination running wild, I can't help but admit that I'm getting more and more creeped out. This is a mystery I need to unravel, and soon. I was on a hunting trip with my father when I was about 14 years old in Georgia. I was in my own spot and my father was in his own about a mile off. It was black powder season and I hear the boom of a black powder rifle go off in the direction of my father's spot. I start heading that way to help him field strip the deer. About a half a mile away I then hear my father screaming help. Help. I immediately book it as fast as I can through the swamp and briars quite slowly because of how thick it was, while my father yells the entire time. I just knew that he had either fallen out of his stand or his old black powder rifle had exploded and injured him and I was thinking of what I would do when I got there, neither of us had cell phones and we were a couple miles away from any phone. The yelling goes from help to it's okay Bubba I'm okay. Bubba is my nickname which is also now my son's who thinks it's his actual name, in the span of about 5 minutes. A couple minutes later I find my father, lying almost fully submerged in a creek with a massive 10-point buck laying on him. My father believed to have shot this deer, climbed down from his stand, got to the creek when this deer came out of some brush and gored him in the arms. He fell into the creek with the deer's antlers stuck in his arm and was able to drown the deer on behalf of it being stuck. It turned out the shot had only hit the deer in the leg and the deer charged him when he came down to look for it. Most people never believe me when I tell this story and I probably wouldn't either had I not been there. I have the head of that mean some bitch hanging in my office. My mom has worked at a small, rural hospital for about six years now. She is the ER receptionist. So she is the first person you see when you come into the emergency room, the one to give you all the paperwork to fill out and such. Throughout these six years, she worked mostly nights, 7 p.m. to 7 a.m., and has seen quite the cast of characters the town has to offer. Every transient, druggie, and local, has passed through that lobby and she has seen each one at least twice. But, one night, she encountered something she had never seen before, or again since. Back in the first year, my mom was quick to get the hang of things, so she was left alone to work the counter. The ER faced the parking lot, so she could see people coming in from far away, and anticipate their moves. One night, 
at about 2 a.m., she was working on her computer, looked up, and was surprised to see two people standing there. A man and a woman, just standing there, staring at her, and she stared back. The parking lot was dark, no car in sight, and they just appeared. After a long moment, they came into the lobby, and went right up to the desk. My mom said the alarm bell started going off in her head that something wasn't right. For one thing, they were very tall. The desk my mom sat at would come up mid-chest to an average person. With these people, my mom could see the pelvic bone of the woman. They were dressed for hot weather, because it was summer. They were also very skinny, and, my mom emphasized this, very dry looking. But, they didn't look like your typical druggies. The woman kept stroking her neck with long fingers, saying she had a sore throat. My mom, for the first and only time, didn't say a word. She just looked at them. A word kept repeating in her head stregoy. As my mom looked at them, the woman looked to the man, looked back at my mom, then to the man again, the whole time just smiling and stroking her throat, and said to the man do you think she will let us through? Or should we go somewhere else? My mom stayed silent as the woman repeated the pattern of looks, then they both smiled at my mom and left. Almost after, my mom texted me, asking if vampires needed permission to enter places like hospitals. I told her, since she was technically the person to say who went back to the ER, they would need her permission. We both knew that Stregoi was a type of Romanian vampire mythos, and that was the word she kept hearing in her mind. She has never seen the couple again. And we still talk about what happened. And it does make me wonder when I hear about stories of black-eyed children and other tales of vampires, what did she see that night? And, how close was she to something? Unreal? One night in early summer, I believe, a guy named Kevin came back to my girlfriend at the time little brother's house. He started to tell us he had seen a four foot tall owl leaving his house last night. I grew up in this very area, in Indiana, when I was younger. And at first, I thought he was telling us some cheesy joke or story. When he didn't laugh, we knew he was serious. That's when we started to laugh at him. He claimed this happened to him right across the street, and about halfway through the woods. I completely thought he was making this up, wasn't sure why he would though. I personally thought he was lying. I then asked him if this happened across the street then take me to where you saw it then. I'm glad I had him show me. At the time I really thought he was double downing on his lie. I wasn't expecting anyone else to follow us, but everyone who came with me was there. When he brought us to the spot I looked carefully, being the outdoorsman I was. Nothing, no scratches on the ground, no blood no fur. He also added he thought it was eating something because as he cut through he thought someone was sitting hunched over in the dark. He then added that he said who's there? It lifted up over this head carrying something he thought. He said it then screeched at him, and that was all. We laughed and made fun of him for the next few years even. He got it bad. We thought he was lying and we all figured if you're going to lie, you're going to have to deal with us making fun of you for catching you in that lie. Kevin never brought it up again or even tried to defend himself. I looked right at him, and asked, why to pick an owl? He was a little confused by this question. And just said what do you mean? Then I said, why pick an owl? Owls aren't even scary. Then in the early spring of 2007, my friend Josh, who lived a few streets over from where this Kevin guy was, saw this four foot tall owl. I completely forgot he told us about it unless we would see him for a laugh. I thought he was just making it up. Josh and I cut through the same woods he saw it in, but from the other way. We could see all the way through from the street. His woods is long, but maybe only 100 yards wide. As we get to about halfway, we both hear something running on the leaves in our direction fast. I'm a little bit taller than Josh. I was able to turn around and took a few steps jumping and pulling myself up. Josh was running out of time, and I told him to jump and grab my hand. There was a mean pitbull dog that the owners would sometimes let loose at night to roam. 
At the last second Josh jumped on a little sapling tree and climbed it like a rope. About two weeks later we would be doing the same thing again, only when we heard the leaves moving on the ground it was a large raccoon instead. I started to walk again, towards Dennis's house and then I heard a wooden diving board noise. When I heard this, I just stopped in my tracks and started to scan looking for the source of the noise. Eventually, I'd turn around and started to look behind us, and that's when I noticed the very large branch, still whipping up and down. Now even more confused I'm looking for what came out of this large branch, not seeing anything. Most if not all my focus was on the ground near the base of the large oak tree. The way the limb was moving something very large would have jumped out. The only thing that didn't make sense was, I'm looking at nothing on the ground. I turned back to Josh and said Bobcat, only to have him roll his eyes at me. I wouldn't have believed it either except to me it was the only thing that would have weighed enough to shake the branch like that, but never make a sound possibly when it hit the ground. So I'm literally waiting for a big cat to show itself and pounce. After another full minute, nothing happens and I'm even more confused and started to walk toward Dennis's house. I take a few more steps, still looking around but facing forward back at his house. I started to catch movement out of the top corner of my eye and what I explained next, I would have never thought in a million years I'd be telling or saying. It was just a black mass or a black ball shape, darker than the night sky around it. When I see this I freeze because I'm just not sure what I'm looking at. It's still above the treetops, halfway through this woods probably putting it in the 100 feet range up, just right above the tips of the tree. I was first and Josh was still somewhere behind me. I stayed focused on the dark movement and didn't want to lose view of what it was. I was walking down a path to the entrance to the woods. As I was about to enter, I could see a flashlight walking down a path in the woods coming towards me, appearing to be scouting the area for something. I decided to wait near the entrance until they passed, which is still a few hundred yards from civilization, or any light at all, as they got closer, I could make out a male voice talking to someone, over my very loud music. I assumed he was on the phone. Nothing too odd. However, as I expected him to walk past me, he did not. He stood around four feet to the side of me. It was really dark, so he was just a silhouette but I could see he had a massive F off German Shepherd on a leash. He's still noticeably talking but it didn't seem like he was trying to get my attention. At this point, I turn away and start walking towards the woods, when I can clearly hear him shouting something. That is when I pull one earphone out of my ear and hear something to the effect of it's the police, take your earphones out and stop walking away. Realizing that he was in fact shouting at me the entire time, I turn around and say I'm sorry, I didn't know, and all that jazz. He asks for my name, what I'm doing there, and how long I had been there. I tell him. Then he says well I'm looking for someone and clearly you're not them. Have you seen a girl around here? To which I reply that no, I hadn't, and then he walks off back into the woods. That is the end of that story. I walked away and went home. Not the creepiest. I know. But I am left with questions. Why was he looking for a girl, in the dark, alone, at that time? And also, if he were looking for an armed criminal, appearing to ignore him and walking away could have ended very badly for me. I'm thankful he didn't lose his cool. That is if he was even a cop. He did say he was, but I never saw his uniform as it was so dark. I have not yet seen anything on the news, I just hope the girl is okay, whatever happened. Driving home from Kingman, Arizona after grocery shopping a silver manta ray shaped creature or craft with a glowing neon green cockpit with green and blue exhaust flames coming out of the tail end instantly appeared over my car windshield about 5 to 6 feet in the air. It was as if it was watching over me while driving in the darkness on my dirt road for a couple of minutes until I reached my house. The craft seemed to undulate like a living being. Then it just disappeared into the clear dark night.
I have seen various objects flying around my house and found several burned up bushes from exhausted flames. I've been trying to find someone to report the sightings to since they were occurring nightly. I told my brother Jack and my daughter about it. My brother Jack thought I was seeing things until I showed him the images from my security cameras outside. My daughter told me to contact you. I started staying with friends and family and not at home alone. Would really like for someone to please come out there and investigate these numerous sightings. My brother finally believed me when he was visiting one weekend helping me fix barbed wire fencing around the house. He saw for himself strange objects flying over us in the night. They were also witnessed by his girlfriend who was helping us. There was a formation of lights which I thought was a squadron of military planes but there was no sound and then they flew out of sight instantly. We have more details but too much to explain in this report. Due to the fact this has been ongoing for almost a year. I would like to know what is going on around my house. This happened to me and my friend around 9.30 PM on a Saturday if I recall. I live in an area where not much goes on and is pretty safe for the most part. Anyways, me and my friend are dumb teenagers, both male, that love urban exploring. Our favorite sites to explore are tunnels. Around 7.30 PM one night, me and my friend were exploring some sites around the park two blocks away from our house, full of small tunnels to explore. We felt a little weird because we felt as if we weren't alone, there were a couple of disc golfers but we had just watched them leave. So at this point the park was completely empty. My friend and I were just exiting a small tunnel to get back to the park as we were waiting for the disc golfers to leave so we could go to the next secret spot, which were train tracks that are sometimes in use. To get into the train tracks you have to go through an off path in the woods that has a few curves, so it was hard to see. My friend lead the way. A few seconds later I thought I had lost him so I yelled his name. Here's when things got weird. I heard what seemed almost like a distant yell or shout from the train tracks. I thought he had sped up so I jogged up ahead and eventually ran into my buddy that was just around a curvy turn. I asked him if he was okay and he replied yes like nothing had happened. A little suspicion ran through my mind so I asked him if he had yelled at me from the tracks and had come back to get me. Shockingly, he didn't, he was waiting for me just at the turn and he also said he heard the yell. Well, my friend and I are idiots, instead of going back, we quietly continued to the tracks. When we got up to the bridge with the train tracks. There was absolutely no one or nothing up there. Although, I felt like we were being watched from the trees or something. I let my friend know about this feeling and we quickly stopped throwing rocks into the creek and headed back to the park. I knew something was wrong as we were leaving, I just couldn't put my finger on it. We played around on the basketball court at the park before we left. Due to the creepy vibe, my friend and I decided it was best to take the main road back instead of the shortcut through the woods that led to our neighborhood. It was around 9.30 now, my friend and I were talking about what we should do all night, because he was spending the night. The park has a soccer field across the street from it, so it has two gravel parking lots that are sorta of hidden by the trees. As we were walking past one of the gravel lots, I felt what seemed like a warning from my body. I passed it off as nothing, but as we crossed the street from the gravel lot, here's where things started getting really creepy. I could see someone come out of the shadows of the gravel lot. They had appeared to be wearing very dark clothing, and a hoodie to cover their face. I was throwing red flags everywhere. The way that they came out of nowhere was so subtle and perfectly timed. It felt as if they were waiting for us to cross to start following us. My friend hadn't seemed to notice the strange figure, I told him to jog up ahead a little. He seemed confused, so I pulled him close to me and told him what had just happened. He seemed anxious, so we picked up the pace a little. Every once in a while I would look over my shoulder to see where he was. Every time I looked he would be at least three feet closer to us. I could hear the figure's eerie breathing. Thank God we were close to an alley shortcut that no one really uses but me and my friends. To get to it, you go up a little hill left of the street. 
I saw this as an opportunity, I mumbled to my friend use the alley, he quickly nodded yes. The second we made it to the hill, we casually jogged up ahead to the alley. I told my friend to wait for a second, I peeked over to the street from the alley. And there I saw them, what appeared to be a man in his thirties was making his way towards us very quickly, I could see his eyes now, they were staring directly at me with an evil look. I told my friend to bolt up the damn alley to his house, which was connected to the alley. We had never ran so damn fast. We made it up to the street and take a sharp turn to the left. We had lost him at this point. We sprinted through his front door and locked every single entrance. We turned off all the lights and hid for what felt like an hour. Thank God, he was nowhere to be seen. I have never seen this person ever again and I hope not too. When I was a kid, around 7 years old, my grandma would often take my sister and me swimming at the river. I can remember one incident as clear as day, and it still sends shivers down my spine. Grandma, always engrossed in her Facebook scrolling, rarely paid close attention to our antics. My sister and I weren't accomplished swimmers, yet we loved the water. One day, while we were splashing around, a group of older kids approached us. They dared us to venture into the deep end of the river, and despite our limited swimming abilities, we took up the challenge, driven by youthful naivety. As I was wading deeper into the river, I saw what I thought was my sister struggling in the water. But something was off. Even though my sister was smaller than me, the figure in the water seemed larger, more ominous. Despite the fear creeping into my heart, I instinctively wanted to help. But as I took a step toward her, the riverbed dropped off sharply into the deep end, and I found myself drowning. Just when I was sure I wouldn't make it, the older kids yanked me back to the shallower water, saving me from what could have been a tragic accident. Meanwhile, my grandma was blissfully unaware of the near catastrophe, her eyes still fixed on her phone screen. It's the aftermath of the incident that still haunts me. My sister had somehow reappeared, safe and unharmed, oblivious to the horrifying scene that had just transpired. But the thing that I can't shake off is the fact that the struggling figure I saw in the water was not my sister. Not only did the size not match up, but the cold, unblinking death stare that she, or rather, it, gave me is still etched in my memory. And its disappearance was just as sudden and inexplicable as its appearance. There was no way my sister could have swum that fast or disappeared that quickly. So, what did I see in the river that day? A trick of the light, a figment of my imagination, or something more sinister? I guess I'll never know. But one thing's for sure, it wasn't my sister. Growing up, I was always drawn to the mysterious, the eerie, and the unexplainable. Cryptids, paranormal activities, and monsters that lurked in the shadows held a fascinating allure for me. Much of this curiosity was stoked by a story my father would often tell me. The tale is an important piece of my childhood and a kernel for my interest in the supernatural. My father grew up in the scenic expanses of Oregon, a place replete with lush woods and towering mountains. One day, while he was still a young boy, he accompanied his father, my grandfather, on a trek into the forest. This particular expedition left a deep impression on my father and became the subject of a story he would recount time and again. As they delved deeper into the verdant wilderness, they were suddenly assaulted by a nauseating stench. It wasn't the earthy smell of decay or the sharp tang of wild animals, this was something else, something unfamiliar and unsettling. As they continued, they heard the ominous sound of something large moving through the trees and brush ahead of them. The source of the sound was hidden from view, concealed by the dense foliage, but they could hear it moving, the crunch of branches underfoot, the rustle of leaves. Then, just as abruptly as it started, the noise ceased, replaced by the usual sounds of the forest. Driven by curiosity and perhaps a touch of fear, they decided to investigate. Upon reaching the spot, 
They were astounded to see branches broken off at a height that suggested a tall creature had passed through. It was as if something enormous, something taller than a man, had ambled through the woods, leaving only snapped branches and a lingering stench as evidence of its presence. Though the story might seem thin on specifics, the mystery it presented was enough to enthrall my young mind. Every time my father would recount it, I'd hang on to his every word, visualizing the scene and imagining what the creature could have been. Every time I looked at the sprawling forests and majestic mountains of the Pacific Northwest, I would feel a twinge of excitement. It seemed all too plausible that something could be hiding in those vast, unexplored areas. And to this day, the possibility of uncovering such hidden creatures and unraveling their mysteries continues to stoke my fascination for the unknown. Thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe for daily stories. We at Horror Den of Misfits really enjoy this, and your support would be appreciated.